I'm nervous right now. Like, <laughs> what are you nervous about, Adam? <laughs> Some really, really good questions, Jesse. Okay. You're really, you're really helping make me better. I don't know if you know that or not, but man, I am so thankful for you. Like, your ability to ask questions is pretty profound. I'll just put it to you that way. That's why I'm nervous. <laughs> and I wish you could hear my sound effects because I got the scary one going. Oh yeah, that's my buddy, Mr. Adam Hoots. He began his career as a plumber's apprentice, and you're going to hear a, a pretty funny little story about how he got that first job. And now he's a major contributor in bringing respect back to the trade. So now you know why he's on the show. In the next 80 minutes or so, Adam is going to get you pumped up about some super cool things that are happening in our industry and what the future looks like for us. And he also lays down the wisdom he uses for selecting the mentors in his life and living his purpose. He's also a cheater, not that kind of cheater. Adam cheated and asked me a couple of questions and got me to reveal my ikigai. What's an ikigai? Well, stay tuned and you will find out exactly what ikigai is on a little reminder that we do have a patreon account where you can sign up all of your contributions are going to go to keeping us commercial free and helping us enhance some of the stuff you know now we're using the script and we're doing some other little things because we got a little bit of cash coming in that it'll help improve the quality of these, these podcasts for you and i'm gonna stop talking and you're gonna start listening to mr adam hoots here we go The whole point of this is to highlight the careers in the trades. And we do that by honoring you and, and sharing your story. We're going to honor the trades people, the important people, because my story don't really matter, Jesse. I'm just like an old washed up trades guy now. Yeah, but that's the thing. <clears throat> There's trades people out there that think they're limited. There's a cap on them. And you're proof that there isn't. And then there's people out there that think tradespeople are just only ever going to be tradespeople. And you're proof that that's false. So it's providing an image uh, for people to see that says, yeah, what you thought is wrong. But it's really the disrespect that drove me out. Nobody wants to live like that. That's Agreed. what we're going to change, man. I almost feel a little guilty for encouraging people to like, come into the trades because we haven't fixed that respect for your existence thing yet. Well, here we are with Mr. Adam Hoots coming in from South Carolina. Adam, can you guess where I'm at, man? New York City? <laughs> Not yet. I'm in Kansas <laughs> City today. Kansas uh, City. Trying to work off a big giant beef rib that I had out at uh, Jack Black Barbecue. And I got to say it. Kansas City barbecue is the best. I plead the fifth. <laughs> you were like too that. quick. You were in and out here. You, you, you didn't give us a chance. One day. Oh, one day. I got to go hit up that South Carolina barbecue, man. It's good stuff. All my people here back home in Texas, they hate it when I say Kansas City's got the good stuff. But they do. So far. So far. Mm. I love it. So, Adam. Thank you, man, for giving us some time. I know you had a ball game this morning. How did that go? We went 2-0 and this morning, Jesse. So it's, yeah, we're just getting back to the season. It's the fall season. Love the coach. Bill Henderson's amazing. Uh, he squeezes an entire fall season in before college football starts. So that's my man. Yeah, he's got a, a solid plan. He does the kids well. But, yeah, they went 2-0. and Very proud of him. You know, boy made some amazing defensive plays. It's funny, you know, he went 0 for 1 with a strikeout, but he had four walks, 16 balls. He was so selective at the plate. I'm so proud of him. And like yes. a couple of defense, like, oh my goodness. It, you know, patience is uh, is something he's learning from his mama really, really well. <laughs> OBP, man, people get caught up on that batting average, but on base percentage, you can't score runs if you're not on base. Bottom line. That's right. Mm. Well, Adam, we'll just jump right into it, man. What do you want the L&M family out there to know about you, my friend? Well, so I'm an old trades guy, I guess. You know, I started as a plumber's helper. I did that for a couple of years and realized that 
you know, it was some really tough work and wasn't well respected. And so, you know, I've I've seen construction from a lot of different angles and I'm excited to be at a point where advancement isn't really the goal. It's really raising other people up around us. I'm excited for that. I love what's happening, like the energy over the last six months. I was reflecting a lot last night, just what's happened in the last six months, even just starting with that little change makers pod and, and there's some really cool things going on in our industry right now. It's ripe for change and it's happening and it's fun to be a part of that. So don't know if I answered your question, you but did, man. Uh, and that's where I'm at right now. That's uh, it's really where my head's at. Good, good. You mentioned you started in the trades and I seem to remember that you started as a result of receiving a special gift. What was that gift, man? Yeah, it was the gift of life, right? So here I am, right? 17, turning 17 years old. And man, I'm so excited because I just know my dad's going to buy me a brand new car, right? It's yes. a brand new Mustang. Like that's what I've been talking about. My grades are good. I'm an athlete. Like everything is good and solid and I'm working and I'm lo like learning, like just big old gift in the dining room table when I come home. It was a week before, so he made me wait a week as well, nonetheless. So I get there, man, this thing's like professionally wrapped and it's like <clears throat> just beautiful. And I'm like ripping this thing open and I open it and it's like, it's, I was so disappointed. I looked at him and just kind of smiled with this smirk, like you son of a gun. <laughs> uh, you know what I was thinking. Oh it's, yeah. Like it's definitely wasn't keys. It was a hard hat. It was a vest. It was brand new boots, Wolverine boots. I'll never forget. And on top, you know, all the, all the PPE I needed to be successful on a job. And then at the bottom was a stack of job applications and they were everything, you know, electrician, the plumber, it was all people that were working with him at the time on, on one of the jobs. So yeah, I selected plumber. I don't really know much about it. I just kind of, hey, it looks cool. You know, pipe seems great. Little did I know I would be swimming in shit very soon. So pardon the non PG there, but that's really what it was. What a birthday gift that was. I will never, ever forget that. Nor will I ever do that to my child. My goodness. Maybe <laughs> You're a better man than me. Yeah. <laughs> You're a better man than me. Cause that's a I, fantastic idea. It's one of those things. I hated him at the time, but man, <clears throat> right now looking back on it, it's like, okay, I get the purpose. Like I understand what he did, why he did it instilled work ethic in me and a respect for that person and that person's existence. And so you know, again, just recognizing, you know, when you're walking a job and, you know, you grab that and you're like helping them sweep or picking up the tray, like doing things that like you shouldn't no normally, normally that's not your role. And so it just says, adds a sense of empowerment and engagement. Like you were one. Now you also mentioned that when you entered the field, there was a lack of respect. Can you describe that for the L and M family out there that that's never been on a job site? So just to be clear, there's still a lack of respect, <clears throat> right? And you agree with that? Agreed. Yeah, it's, it, it was very much a, a man. And I hate to use these terms. I probably shouldn't, but it was a master slave relationship. It was like, a, it didn't matter what I said and go do it period. Mm -hmm. And I know those are really strong words. And again, you know, I, I, my heart's in the right place. I promise you that. But it, it really felt like you had no choice and, and you had no say in the matter and it, it, you did not matter. And so, which is the complete opposite of what we're learning right now, man, it was just no regard for your existence whatsoever. Like get in that hole full of you know, feces and repair that pipe. And you're looking at them like, I don't even know what repair that pipe means. <laughs> and so you're down there like trying to figure out what size pipe it is and like, all this wasted motion when a true plumber would have, you know, looked at it at four inch PVC, give me, you know, a couple of fittings and a, a stock pipe. Let's hop down, you know, clean it up and, you know, get and make it go. So, but you don't know that at that. And so they, you know, they toss you in the hole and they're just laughing at you. Like, you don't know what you're doing. And mm -hmm. then you're riding home, right. To get back home and you have a Cavalier Z24 with no AC and it's black in Orlando, Florida, and you're, just got out of a nasty hole and you drive ooh, like the disrespect for yourself even like not ooh. just how do you respect yourself when you don't have a say you've shut your mouth the whole day you've been swimming in crap the whole day and now you're driving across and i'm hating my dad the whole time like man what are you doing to me but you know what it it it's it's hard to explain but it's uh 
you know, it's the it's essential, right? Like you become essential to society in such a way that nobody else is and, and things don't work right without you. And so when you start to understand that, that bring, brings a whole new sense of respect to the manor. And so that's what I love about learnings and missteps and everything that you do, Jesse, is changing the image of this of the skilled trades, right? Like you're a plumber, man, and you got a podcast and you're like, man, you were a lean manager at a billion dollars. Like, and now you're doing crazy things with lifetime and, and like safety and you're taking it to all new levels. And so you're a plumber, man. And look what you're doing. Like, look what you started. That's so cool to see that come to fruition. And I just, I admire that and, and want to encourage others and empower others to make that happen. Oh man. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I mean, you know, one thing that, that's important to note is along it, it happened as a result of beautiful, amazing people coming into my life. I mean, all the way back to some of those mentors, Johnny Martinez, you know, my old man, Papa Juan, Sid Wilkerson, Jim Jones. I mean, there's tons of people that you, Jennifer Lacey, felt like all the way through my career that, that have made major impact on my thinking and the way I see things and help me believe in myself because my view, when I think of things, all I think of is I see my self image. My self image is that skinny little troublemaking plumber from the South side of San Antonio. I don't think of, you know, I've done, I've been a part of some pretty amazing things like the change makers pod or the construction change makers live streaming that we've been doing. Like I'm up there with ballers, and I'm like, do I belong here? Like, what am I, what am I doing here, man? Do they know, do they know who they invited to the party? But again, it's a, you know, it's a result of being blessed with amazing human beings along the way. How do you create that vision at first? Like, how do you, like, <clears throat> that's something, again, you know, we talk about getting into the schools early and, but yeah, you know, how do we create that vision of success where people can actually visualize that? How did you do that personally? Oh man, damn it. You're not supposed to be asking those kinds of questions, Adam. No, it's a great question. I'll say this. It's, it's probably more going on faith of what people see in me than it was what I saw within myself. And, and what I mean by that, so going back to your, your example earlier of, of, you know, fixing that damn busted pipe with crap and toilet paper and corn and baby roots floating all over the place, right? Like if, in case you didn't know listeners, it's, it, there are some less than sexy things that got to be done out in the industry. And Couldn't that works. to find sexy, I guess, Jesse, <laughs> some weird people out there. Yeah, oh, that's true. That's true. That'll be on the fans only content. <laughs> I'm always scared when I see that stuff. <laughs> so the work still has to be done. And, and to your point earlier, that work that has to be done, that's gross and stinky and uncomfortable, keeps things going for the rest of our community and our society, right? That makes us essential, <laughs> essential AF, I love the shirt. And, and so if we wanna, I, I learned the hard way that we've gotta be able to change our perspective on things. Like the situation is you're in a ditch with turds and you're gonna get it all over yourself. That's not gonna change. But what I do have control over is changing my perspective about it. So if I see it in the sense of this is crap work, this is gross, this is, you know, blah, 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 then that's what it is. But if I see it at, in terms of and in order to fix this thing or in order to keep this building functioning and these students or these doctors or these lawyers keep them functioning and serving the community to their greatest capacity, that's a different thing. It's the same type of work, but it's an absolutely different perspective. But don't get me wrong, early on, I, did, I was not able to, to change my perspective on things, except that there were some really good people around me that would challenge me. I swear for the longest time, I worked for TD Industries for 17 years and, and I worked for Turner Construction for just over three years. And you know, the same old generic question, where do you see yourself in five years, right? Like, come on, man, give me, give me something good. 
my answer was always my dream where I want to be is making more money with less responsibility, working from 7 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. That's where I want to be in five years. And, and everybody responded just like you did right now. Like, what the hell are you talking about? My point is, it is very easy. It's a very comfortable space for me to go and lay out some sanitary line, install some hangers, run some pipe, get it tested, make all the letters read the same way, make it flow appropriately, no leaks. Like, that's a day, man. But like your, your deal up there, capability development, there were capabilities within me that had I only done that, those capabilities would not have been developed. And had I not developed those capabilities, I would have underserved my community. And so there were people in my life that continued to challenge me and said, go to apprenticeship school, man. You need to go to apprenticeship school so you can learn the trade, not just how to do it, but the design and, and what's going on behind that. And after that, it was like, go to night school. So you can start learning about business, construction, business management, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, I could do that. Then it was like, you need to go start studying leadership so that you can learn how to serve people and support people. And so it was this type of thing that people kept feeding me. And I'm telling you at the time, I mean, even apprenticeship, I'm like, shit, man, well, I, can I make it? Do I, do I even what, have what it takes? And that's always the question. Do I even have what it takes? And so far, the answer is hell yeah. And, and, and so that's, that's how I got here. The other part is as you know, maybe the last five years, I recognized, or rather I matured, I think I matured from, from seeing people as, as uh, competition and letting competition trigger collaboration. Like when I get like automatically, I uh, automatically to this day, I meet somebody and they sound smarter than me. Like, okay, it's on. I'm going to take your ass down. But I got to let that trigger me. Like, no, 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 no. I can learn from this person. And we can do great things together. But I've got to disconnect from my ego. When I started understanding that, it's like, okay, what I need to do is be very selective about who I share my thoughts with and take ideas from. And, and they are going to be people that I've got to look up to. Because if they're people that I can look up to, I am going in that direction. That's the direction I want to go. And so it's evolved over time, but that's where I'm at now. Is that, did I even touch on the question you asked? Yes. And you got my mind running in so many different directions. <laughs> uh, I, so you said something earlier and I have it written behind me and I'm starting to dive into it, but language action. Hal Maycomer's kind of taken me down this trip and, and I'm so looking forward to the journey, but you know, I've started with capability development with Dean Reed and, and I've discovered habits and, and mindset. I love those words like that word mindset because, yep. you know, we talk about visualizing things and seeing it in action and believing that you can do it and then doing it right. We talked uh, even exchanged text earlier with Jen on, on attitudes and behaviors and, and how that you know, reinforces success and systems. You also mentioned something that I've done a little bit of research on, on cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that feeling that you described of like, am I good enough? Uh, can I actually pull it off? And I'll tell you that never stops, right? And that holds a lot of people back from going and doing and changing the world and when you can approach a situation with just the confidence and calmness and understanding that i can live in the moment and i can help these people grow around me while still growing with them yeah. and that's the part i think a lot of folks often miss is that that growth is always two ways internal and external and so it's really about driving the need for additional like like getting outside your comfort zone getting through that fear like fighting through that fear to be able to, to develop and 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 get better over time so yeah i love i love the answer and again it's that vision it's it's you know why some people struggle they've never seen a member of their family be successful or They've only seen a member of their family be successful up to a certain point, right? Like yes. maybe there's no millionaires in their family. So is it really a possibility? Because nobody that looks like me has done that. We'll leave it at that because I don't want to dive too far off the deep end or we'll be here 
all day. No, but you nailed it. I mean, and that's the purpose for the podcast is so that people can see that. They can see, yeah, I'm, I'm in a ditch, but I can get there. Or the other people that walk by the ditch and say, man, look at them crummy ass construction workers. Now they're going to hear this and they say, man, listen to this dude. Adam is like deep. Like he knows what he's talking about. He's got real deep insight to how the human psyche works. And people, most people wouldn't think twice about that. Like the last interview I had with Mr. Kevin Chase, I mean, he's, he's a construction professional, phenomenal dude. And I asked him straight, I'm like, dude, before you got into construction, what did you think of construction workers? And he's like, man, like, honestly, I didn't think much about them because the image that is portrayed out there is, you know, just loud mouth, smack talking, uh, cigar chewing, cussing, no cigar chewing. Well, <laughs> busted. <laughs> Not pleasant to be around. Always stopping me from getting places efficient and fast. Like always making me stop. You got it. And that's why I love having guests like you on the show because you've come a long way. And, and it wasn't by accident and it wasn't through privilege, it was through work and, and dedication. So we started talking about how respect is lacking in the industry and your experience as a first year plumber's helper right out of the gate. And you, you also mentioned that we're still lacking respect for the trades. Tell us more about that. What, what are your thoughts there? Well, for ultra clarity's sake, I am, I mean, I'm, I'm a white, male so i do have a certain privilege that's associated with that so Fair you made enough. a statement that i didn't have a privilege earlier and i just want to clarify that that i do understand my position from that perspective and so again not to jump off the deep end there but i i, I do value and appreciate that word that's what i'm talking about like that's why you're badass like you just straight up own the privilege thing where a lot of that's that's a touchy subject for a lot of people so thank you for that Man, I applaud you. <laughs> Have you. You've seen the video on Facebook, I'm sure. You're enough social media engaged where, like, if you have two parents that loved you, express love, take a step forward, and they're all oh, yeah. $100. Man. Mm -hmm. Powerful. I mean, those are realities in life, and it takes, it takes some humility, that tremendous humility and ownership to be able to say, shit, yeah, I, I got it a little better than other people do, and that, that in I itself... <laughs> I agree with you, Jesse. It's one thing to recognize it, but then it's a, it's a whole nother thing to share it and mm. be responsible with it. And, and again, I, I've actually talked about this and I really wish we weren't going here right now. Cause again, it's a really slippery slope, but I'm comfortable because I've had this conversation with a lot of folks that look like me and sure. I often hear, I didn't get nothing. Like I worked hard for this and it's like, yeah, I done. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You did. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Good Absolutely. Job. But, but but there are you know, opportunities that were provided to you because of what you look like. And that's, I think the world's getting better, but we still have a long way to go from that perspective. So again, I, I'd love to dive into a podcast to that. I think we need the right people Ooh. in the room to make that happen. And I could even bring some of those folks for what it's worth. Real talk, baby, real talk. I'm up for it. I mean, uh, that's how we're gonna get better as a community, right? That's how we're gonna understand each other's perspectives and have empathy for one another and drive the narrative forward. Like, let's stop talking. Here's a cool thing, just reflection on, on those words, stop talking. Uh, there was a gal named Holly from NCCER that participated in, in our Skilled Trades Alliance board meeting yesterday. And uh, she's like, Man, and I'm like, she talked at the end. She's like, I'm blown away. Like most people just stand around and talk. You all are just updating each other on what you're doing. Mm. And so, boy, was that powerful. Like, what are we doing about action. it? Yeah. So language action, right? Like that's, you're really circling us back. Like if I talk about it as it's a shitty job and I'm in a hole and I'm swimming in shit and corn and turtle, it's different than, hey, I'm saving this doctor's office who might be saving a, a life here tomorrow. When you start approaching it from that mindset and using that language, all of a sudden your action becomes respected. And, and then from inside out, right? Like, so to me, this is, you asked about where are we missing respect? Like to me, it's inside out. If we don't respect our craft workers as, as the supervisors, as managers, superintendents, as tradesmen, for, like foremen, crew leaders, 
how do we ever expect anybody? How do we expect that room to stay the same when I have my when I exchange my three piece vest for my construction vest? Like how we, if we don't respect the worker, how will we be respected? And so it's about giving. It's about, you know, elevating, as as Miss Jen Lacey would say, right, elevating others and, and empowering them. I mean, why would you not want them to make these decisions? They're closest to the information and let them innovate. Let them in, like, why, what, like Toyota taught us this, like pull the thing, pull the cord if you need to stop it. We got to empower folks. We, we got to stop treating them like robots. And that is a little side hustle of mine. If anybody needs to buy a human collaborative robot, you let me know. Sorry, a shameless plug, but I do feel like humans do a lot of jobs that robots should do to allow humans to innovate and do more research and development and, and empower them in ways that they're not currently empowered. And so that's my passion there on that side. But yeah, I just, you know, until we can respect the worker internally, and, and that goes from all stages of, of putting them in the wrong situation, or simply let's talk about the Porta Johns on the site or you know whatever else might be the disrespect just the top down uh, driving or disrespectful dictatorship leadership i wouldn't even call it leadership dictatorship is the best word and, and until we can stop that we'll, we'll never be respected as an industry and, and i think that's what we all want is to be respected as an industry when they see us they we're equals right so anyway i'll, I'll get off that soapbox but respect is everything not just respect for respect like we say respect for people respect for people like that in the zulu tribe in africa i think i've told you this already sayubona and i don't know if i pronounced it right i probably didn't but i did my best sayubona in the zulu african tribe literally means i see you and i recognize that you exist as a human being that's how they greet each other they don't say hey hello how are you hey hey yeah no they say Jesus Hernandez, the salsa dancing plumber. Sayubona, I see you. You exist. Like, hey, let's move together. That's a big difference in being like, hey, how are you? I've heard this said by some pretty damn smart people. People just want to matter. You heard that before, Adam? <laughs> yeah, I said that in a in a conference. <laughs> I can't even do. Actually, I just traded Jen vibe with your tribe. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure I took that from someone else. I traded her on LinkedIn today for that phrase for people just want to matter. So yeah, I think I can claim that one now. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. I actually, you know, I, I'm rereading because I'm trying to help help Jason write a book on project engineers, but, and, and he's all about how to win friends and influence people. And so I'm rereading that by Dale Carnegie and they say people just want to feel important in the book, mm. which is the same concept, right? Same. So yeah, I, you have my mind going so many different ways. So you mentioned Skill Trades Alliance. I think I think our audience needs to know a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Well, so Skill Trades Alliance has been created here in South Carolina. It's been around for a couple of years. We have been spreading the word on skilled trades, what they are. We've been trying to, I'm sorry, we have been. I don't like the word trying. We aren't trying, we are doing. It is a language action thing, right? So, mm -hmm. so we are getting into schools. We have, you know, K to fourth, fifth to seventh, eighth and ninth, and then tenth to twelfth technical and college activities, presentations, information to help folks understand what the skilled trades are. We're partnered with NCCER, who's been an amazing spot. Like they have just helped us with so many marketing materials and getting the word out. And man, you know, Chrissy Dalton is now her, like I met her two or three years ago in, in a Kurt conference in Phoenix, I believe. And it was a, it was like a young leaders group and she, she's the director of public relations and marketing, I believe at NCCR. And she is just like unbelievable, fantastically awesome. Like insert your made up word here. Like she is just unbelievable and has done so much for skill trades anyway. So, so, so thank you so much NCCR for being involved, but you know, we got Clemson and, and Greenville tech and Greenville County schools and, and you know, veterans programs and reentry programs. And, and we're trying to look at the, the issue of workforce in, in the construction industry, the building skilled trades industry. We've got, you know, Steve with bring back the trades. He's in upholstery. 
So like we were approaching this thing from a lot of different angles, trying to get the word out, trying to spread awareness of all the amazing programs that people are doing. There's so many amazing programs out there, but there's nobody that's like highlighting them all. And so I'm excited to announce that, you know, Jesse and what a place to do it right on your podcast that Jesse and, and the team has pressured me enough that that I'm going to put this new roadcaster to pro to the test and we're going to do a little skilled trades alliance uh, podcast once a month where we're going to highlight programs that are going on existing programs that if it's you know build your future with, with agc or any of these others that you know build your career like there's all kinds of them i think build your futures nccr build your careers maybe agcc everybody's doing like similar things like how do we align and how do we take like the blueprints from each one of them and then make the best program ever and, and not saying skill trades alliance wants to make that program we just want to make everybody aware of everything that's going on out there because there's so many different things going on we're tired of people like just sitting back saying oh we'll and it's this skill like skill of trades nobody wants to go nobody wants can't yeah. quality work cool. it's like, no mm -hmm. we're doing stuff right like we're encouraging we're teaching kids what they are we're teaching reentry programs what they are we're teaching veterans we're teaching homeless we're like we want to go and serve underserved populations those with disabilities we want to modify our workplace to incorporate you know folks that that have been underserved like historically underserved and allow them to take it and run with it it's the only jesse name me another area where you could have a bucket of tools and a brain of experience and go own your own company. Don't worry, I'll wait. <laughs> I wish you could hear my sound effects because Jeopardy's playing right now. <laughs> oh, we, we heard a little hint of it. Man, you know, like, yes, yes, and yes. 100%, it is an amazing industry. I love, I love your fire, man, and especially that podcast is going to be coming up. That's going to be some good stuff. So, you know, we started off with you coming into the trade as a plumber's helper. We've touched on robotics, your side hustle. You're an executive director on the Skill Trades Alliance board. You're co-authoring a book. You've got some other side hustles going on. We know you're eloquent, intelligent, and passionate. What were your earliest career aspirations? If you think back to like middle school, do you remember? I wanted to be a baseball player. <clears throat> okay. Or an announcer. For baseball? Yeah, whatever. Whatever. That's you interesting. Just wait till you watch a sporting event with me. I can be kind of annoying. <laughs> you calling all the plays? I mean, I've got. But from a scientific perspective, right? And it sounds maybe not so humble of me, but I've been in those shoes a lot. I played baseball and football. And so when I like, I understand the game, like you, you can imagine me taking things to the next level. Like when I'm playing football, it's like, okay, you know, I'm the quarterback. I know the game. I know the plays. I know the you know, Omaha, Omaha, like let's, I recognize the defense and let's make adjustments on the fly be agile with it and so you know same with baseball there's like this part of baseball where it's it's like this baseball iq where you know if somebody goes to steal a base right and there's a fly ball to right field so the runners go in there's a fly ball and i'm playing shortstop i'm gonna fake like i'm getting a ground ball because that guy's gonna hustle to second base harder Meanwhile, the guy in right field catches the fly ball, doubles him up at first. And so that's like this baseball IQ, right? I, I, I know I'm like probably way a million ways off from the question, but yeah. So announcer, baseball player, yeah. and you do announcing clearly from the bleachers when you're out watching Mr. <laughs> Kai play some ball. Watch out. Ooh, ooh, he's coming, baby. He's coming. And, and so I'm going to flip that question you asked me back on you. How did you get, how do you go from, you know, want to be a baseball player, getting that beautiful gift at 17 years old to being the virtuoso that you are now? How did that happen? It's the same concept I just explained to you. Like I dive in way too deep, man. Like I was like, okay, if they're going to disrespect me, watch this. Like I'm going to show them how to do this Ooh. damn joint. I'm going to hop in there and they'll only disrespect me once. Like. And that's my MO. I have this accountability thing behind me and Jason and I just did a podcast on it. Well, if you want to know the truth with me, it's like, hey, tell me once. And if I don't get it, then I, I want like a little like, yeah, like accountability check. Like that's just my personality. Um, 
again, assuming that we have a good relationship and it's coming from a place of radical candor. Um, but so it's, it's me, man. I take things like I'm intense. I'm all in. If I dive in and I'm passionate about something and it fits around my icky guy, like I am there. And so, you know, construction, it's hands on. I dove in, I figured it out and made it happen. And they only laughed at me once. And from there, that point on, it was like, oh boy, like we better like, holy cow, we can might even learn something from this guy. And so it's the same way in plumbing, right? Like as in baseball, I just explained like the, you know, fake play or, or like a fake throw in, in, in plumbing. It's the same thing. Like you start developing these just this understanding of the system and where hangers need to go and what the flow needs to look like and how like I can order pipe now and like I, I slowly by slowly increase my capability. I you know there's this concept of the comfort zone. Have you? I'm sure you've seen the bubble. We know we've shared it. We've talked about it. After you get outside your comfort zone, it's that fear zone. And when you can like fly through the fear zone, you get into this learning zone where you really start to develop your capabilities. And then if you keep pushing yourself through this learning and, you know, through this feeling of being overwhelmed, you get into the growth zone where you as a human being are actually growing. And what happens is that expands your comfort zone so that your fear zone becomes like minimal. Uh, Anyway, I dove in like full, like full force. I used to have a, a PM. He's now a VP at Whiting Turner. When I used the words full force, he kind of laughed at me. That's not a thing. It's like bullshit. It is now it's full force, like all in 100% me authentic. And I'm going to learn in, in this small J approach as we talk about often. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm going to take it and be the best damn plumber that I can be. And I did that. And you know, I realized that, you know, I didn't want to be hands-on for my whole life. It is hard work. It's not easy, but it was satisfying. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to be close to it and I wanted to enable and I wanted to empower the others that were around me. I mean, when I first got on, I, you know, I was put with a gentleman who had a drinking issue and he was often allowed me to go and do the work and learn the hard way. And then he wasn't so nice coming back after lunch. That's it though, right? It's all in incrementally improving. And so then you go from there to, well, hell, I don't want to do this. I went extreme opposite. I want to be an architect. I'm going to mm. school for architecture. Like, let's do this. Come on, USF, five-year degree, master's degree. Let's go, baby. Nice. Architect. Mm. Adam, who's architect. the architect? <laughs> so I got really good handwriting. That's why. Are you, you do. So folks, uh, those of y'all that are listening, check us out on YouTube. You can see Adam's beautiful flip charts back there with some art and some very nice, very nice penmanship. It's worth listening to the whole thing again, just to see his penmanship. Now you talked about the comfort zone and, and I imagine we've got some, some young folks out there listening to this and kind of like, whoa, that, that sounded kind of complicated. So I want to break it down in Jesse speak. You know, that, that zone where we're getting to the edge, where the learning's going to happen and the growth is going to explode. What, when I think of that, like that feeling that I get, because I love living there, right? It, it's, it's an addiction for me. And it sounds like it's an addiction for you too, Adam, right? It's like, get me there because that's oh, yeah. where I want to be, right? Like it, it, you're, you're alive. It's the same feeling of being at the high school dance or the middle school dance and you got to go ask old girl, like, hey, girl, you want to dance? You know, like, let's dance. Or, or, hey, boy, stop being scared. Come ask me to dance. That feeling, like, all oh, the butter, the nerves, and like, oh, oh, that's the zone. What do you think, Adam? I love it. I love it. And I love that you're calling me out on this, like, theoretical guy approach. And if I could put it in, like, a, a hoot speak, if you will, mm -hmm. I'd put it in, in this feeling of being like getting ready to go on a roller coaster and mm. you know, like you're real nervous and you don't know if you want to do it or not. And, but you do it the first time and you're like, woo, that was fun. Like we want to do it again. Let's do it again. Like, yeah, yeah, one more time, one more time. So here's a question because I know you love my questions. What characteristics do you look for in people that might help you or that will help you challenge or dance on that edge of your, of the comfort zone? So, <clears throat> That's a good question, and I trust you're okay with my silence back. Yeah, man. It's three things to me. So first off, I I can get I can get outside my comfort zone with just about anybody. Okay. Meaning, 
and with anyone, meaning we can learn something from every person that we engage with, every person, like, even if it's just what temperature it is or if they, what food they don't like. As Again, I hate to keep saying Jen Lacey, but she's such an amazing person that, you know, that's a great icebreaker. Like, we mm-hmm. just learned something about somebody. And so for me, it's three things. It's one, it's like this person is generally the best of the best at what they do. And this is somebody that's going to pull me outside my comfort zone, right? Like, so they're the best of the best. Put a tennis racket in their hand and, man, they're going to crush you in tennis. So you go play some badminton or, or some, some backgammon or, or go read a book and they're going to comprehend it and spit it out or we're going to go swim laps or, or we're going to have a debate or insert new thing here and this person is typically in the better percentage of doing it. Okay. The second thing <clears throat> is because of that, these people who pull me outside my comfort zone work harder than every other person out there. Like they are the first in last out concept and not just like busy work first in last out, but like productive work, asking questions, creating environments, changing behaviors. These people are the hardest working best at what they do. And the third one, and I think it's the most important one, um, and there might be more, but three is just what comes to my head is they're respectful. They mm-hmm. care about people and they come from a place of caring personally and challenging directly. And, and that's Kim Scott's radical candor concept where, so, so if you approach me and, and you're typically the best of the best at what you do and you are work harder than anybody else, I'm talking like, hard and productive and and making things happen and you're simply respectful and and care for humanity we're like hey we and you can pick these people out when we sit down at at lunch and we like engage with the waitress and we're like hey how are you how was your day and you know they they respond or do they respond or do they say yeah yeah i'll take the coke you know And, and those little interactions i don't remember what book it was i read recent but those could change life. Like if you assume that those little interactions could change someone's life or save someone's life, even just a smile goes a long way. Money, babe. Watch out. You got the smile on. <laughs> nice. Got the effects. And we got the sound effects going now, baby. So those are some pretty amazing criteria man and I, I i say amazing because they're uh, universally applicable and that's a, to again for the folks that are listening to this podcast as a means to challenge their comfort zone i want to ask this question to help give them some clarity in that does that those criteria that you listed do you only find people that are super educated, super accomplished that meet that criteria? I don't want people to hate me right now, Jesse. Can I can I plead no contest or can, <laughs> is pleading the fifth? Is that a thing on your show or no? Negative, not on this one. This should be the fans only stuff for what it's worth. <laughs> I can't believe I'm gonna say this. They're gonna make so many people mad because so many smart people teach me so much good stuff. I rarely find those qualities in people who are super, super smart. Mike, drop! Rarely. For me, it's it's a hands-on approach. And now don't get me wrong, I do find those people. And boy, when I find those people, I gravitate to them. When I'm able to understand those people who are super, super, super smart, like I would call those people uber smart. They also pull me outside my comfort zone, you know, and and the growth that I have when I'm around those people because of my practical mindset is like unbelievably exponential. And so when I can start understanding the science of some of this stuff and the reasoning why it works and doesn't work, whether that's psychological or that's production physics or that, you know, the Gemba, uh, Gemba based improvement concept that you so often talk about. No, like, I guess maybe I just learn better from people who are, have a practical mindset. We're able to relate more to one another. And so those people, I feel more comfortable around and they're able to twist and and modify their words to 
help me understand things better. Hmm. I don't know if I answered your question, dodged Absolutely. your question, pissed the world off. You nailed the question and, and your concern about pissing people off. I think for me, there's times where I'll hear some painful, a painful observation, but it's painful because there's truth to it. And it drives me to examine my thinking about that situation so that I can adjust appropriately to better serve. And so for the folks that might be feel that, that little bit of a gut punch on your response, good, because there's room for improvement. And, and Adam just put his finger on it for us. And more importantly, for those folks out there that, that are thinking that they need to have mentors and people in their life that are, are making six figures and have all these things, of, of, have acquired all of these things, that's not what you need. Those qualities that you listed exist in every level of education, every walk of life. It's a matter of understanding what qualities you're seeking. And then when you know what that, that set of qualities is, you can find it in the waitress or in the waiter that, that's serving you. you. I mean, you know it. You meet, we meet people and it's like, oh man, you got it going on. Like, I'm going to learn something from you. When you find those people, you latch on to them. I, I once had an experience with a waitress. We had like 15 baseball kids there. And she listed everybody by number three's family. And like, how genius of an idea was that? Like she came up with a system that worked in, in real time. And so she's wow. a keeper. There you go. That's what it's all about, man. Well, since you've already touched on the fans only content, I'm going to ask you the, the fans only question. Can you share a learning, a major learning you've had as a result of a very painful or even maybe embarrassing misstep that you made in your life. Yes. Come on with it, baby. So, <clears throat> all right. I kind of want to go sit on my couch right now. So the first time I tried to implement last planner. Oh, I know you were waiting for it. I got to put the teaser out there. You want to get the rest of this L&M backstage pass, especially if you want some secret sauce for applying the last planner system and really getting to the heart of problem solving. Sign up for the composite crew level. It'll get you access to this snippet and all the previous snippets. Go to patreon.com slash learnings and missteps. And now back to the show. So I hope yeah. that did you justice. It did. It, it's a powerful one. I read a quote somewhere. The most dangerous place to run a job from is behind the desk and in the trailer. And so it makes me wonder why, why do you think it is it that people default to staying in the office or staying in the trailer rather than going to where the damn problem exists. It's their comfort zone. They're not questioned. They're not challenged. They're not, people aren't watching them. It's easier. I don't like those words, but it's because I, you know, I come from an office mindset, so I got to be careful. I don't piss everybody off. I got to have somebody. <laughs> Stay with me, please, Jesse. If I only have you at the end of this thing, I'll be in good shape. So just I, I, don't, I make you too mad and I'll tone it down. Uh, but, you know, again, and I think this is something I'm learning right now. Like this whole, it's us. And so when I'm like offending all these groups, I trust that I'm offending myself first and foremost, because I like if anybody in, needs to hear these words that are coming out of my mouth, it's me. So I'm thankful I have these big headphones so I can even like turn it up a little bit into my mic there. But so it's us, it's me. It's, it's fighting that, you know, desire to be in your comfort zone. It, it's challenging yourself to get outside that comfort zone through the fear zone. Cause it is like, but you know what happens is when you go out there and you just say, hey, man, where are you from? Or, hey, gal, what, what's on your mind? Or, you know, and what else? And, and did you see that Ray or that, you know, Sox Yankees game, that Field of Dreams game? You know, like building bonds and trust, like but just that quick question and, 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 and then listening with intention to truly understand before you have the next conversation teed up or engaged, you know, when, when 
you and I are talking, I often lose my train of thought, like often, because it's, you know, we've gone at all these different stops on the way and I've got notes and post-its everywhere. And then by the time I go to speak, it's like, you've got me passionate about something totally different. So, yeah, but I think that's important in dialogue. Yes. Yes. You know, you mentioned the gamble-based improvement and you also helped recoin that to FBI field-based <laughs> improvement. Who needs those big <laughs> lean words anyway, yeah, huh? Hell yeah, exactly. Right? Let's not confuse people. Let's just keep it simple. You know, one of the one of the elements of that is is going out and meeting people we don't know, which for me is very easy because that's the way I, I, I'll, I love meeting people. I love talking to people. I love asking questions and listening. I'm nosy. Like that's me. And I just assume that everybody's that way. And so running that exercise with, with general contractor personnel, my assumption was that they were just going to be good at it, right? Cause they've got the authority, they've got the influence. Why would they be uncomfortable going and meeting somebody new on their job site? And what I discovered was, man, it was it was abnormal behavior or an abnormal action for them to just go and meet somebody new. And, and so that just when you responded with it's people's comfort zone, that's why we stay in the trailer. And I'm going to say we because I've been there. That's I did that, too. <laughs> I tried to run projects. Or rather, I tried to run a, a de department through spreadsheets. Like, uh, and I had a boss, Jim Jones, he's like, Jesse, you can mix those spreadsheets back and forth all as many times as you want, but it's gonna have an impact on production because that's not where the problem is. The problem is out on the job. I'm like, son of a bitch, okay, I gotta go out there and, and figure that out. But the skill, of, of going and just talking to people, going to where the problem is, it is a ma major skill. And it's, you know, I would say that it's underappreciated, but I think it's even worse than that. We're just aware of the gap that people have in terms of meeting and connecting with people, period. What do you think? You're dead <laughs> on, baby. You actually planted that seed in my head the other day. You know, I've got a couple big presentations coming up, big presentation, if you will, whatever. It's on capability development and putting that over productivity and and maybe pissing some people off, I hope. When you're talking there, it, it's really about learning both ways, right? Like you have something to offer somebody to maybe build in a better way or in a different flow or in a safer or with more quality type of way. And so what is that person teaching you? Mm -hmm. And being comfortable with giving up the control like that and allowing somebody else to teach you and, and maybe somebody that's not as well educated or so you think that they're not as well educated as you, you know, so just because you've got a, four-year degree and they've got a 30-year degree, they might be able to teach you something. And so it's, you know, being comfortable being uncomfortable, being comfortable giving up the control. And, you know, here's something that I don't tell many people, and I'm so excited to share. Maybe some more fans-only stuff here. Let me... Yeah. Uh, uh, there we go. Let's see it. Let's see it. Hey! And so there's this concept that I'm, I'm like, starting to notice. And I don't want to give it like, this is going to totally screw up our phone calls now, but at the end of a conversation, I want everybody, like I challenge your audience at the end of your conversations, don't be the last one to say goodbye. Don't be the last one to, to just like, okay. Yeah. You too. Yep. 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 Okay. Bye. Oh, yep. 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 Oh, you have a good day. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, just make your statement. Like Jesse, this was a pleasure, man. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for the hospitality. And, and we'll talk till next time. And then just stop. When you allow somebody to have control of the end of a conversation until the next time, that's a really powerful thing. So anyway, I'm a million miles from where we started, but that's, that's, oh, like a, that's how my brain works. Welcome to my brain fans only. You know, just this concept of sharing the privilege maybe, or, you know, allowing somebody else to teach you something, knowing that that person has something in their head that you don't know 
that would benefit you. You ultimately be, you know, grow a bigger bond with that person. Yeah, that is gold. It, it's absolutely, that's a power skill. I'm going to start, I'm going to start practicing that. It's really, really hard. It's almost as hard as giving somebody direct feedback or wait for it, receiving feedback. And just embracing the feedback. Thank you. Mm, mm, mm. Straight thank you, and that's it. Shut your mouth. Let it settle. Ooh, baby. Okay. Just when well. you start getting a lot of trending feedback that's maybe not so positive, then you want to kind of like take it to heart and make some change maybe. I don't know. Just a suggestion. Yeah, like if everybody in your circle is giving you the similar feedback, how likely is it that they're all wrong? It might be you. Oh man, real talk, baby. That's all we've got today. All right, we're rounding third, headed home. Adam, I, I, I know that you've had a major impact on my life, and I imagine you have the same effect on anybody that you touch. So what, what I want to know is, what fingerprint do you intend to leave on the world going forward? I love your questions, Jesse. I just want to take a second to admire your questions while my brain calculates an answer, if that's okay. You got it. Maybe, could you, and I do this a lot, sorry, could you ask it in a different way? Because fingerprint's a strong word. I mean, because I don't necessarily mind if it's my fingerprint, right? Like, eh, I, like I have an icky guy kind of a mission. I guess that's kind of what you're after. Okay. So, for one, I just, like, so here's Hoots is dead, right? Everybody's coming together and they're like, man, what a dude. Like, what a way. Like, he just created environments that made us, other people feel so important and special. Man, like, this is, like, you look around and, and there's just people galore. And it's like, oh, yeah, he touched my life here. Or, you know, I remember back when we were on the baseball team and, you know, little Johnny was the worst hitter in the league and coach hoots like drafted him and believed in him and like changed his vocabulary and he started hitting the ball and now little johnny's in middle school and like succeeding and and now little johnny's like just graduated high school and now he's a coach because coach hoots you know taught him some things that were really cool and you know th this person's a better builder because because hoots came there and enabled everybody to give feedback, right? Like that craft worker that Hoots was that day swimming in shit. Dang, that's the part I got to like. That doesn't happen anymore. Like, like that person's able to say, you know, stop laughing at me. I don't really know what I'm doing. Why don't you come down here and help without mm. getting, you know, reprimanded or fired. And so like enabling other people or you know, when you say fingerprint, those are strong words. Like, but and it all came from a good place, uh, a place with just good energy. There, there's sometimes when you just get this feeling in your belly, and it's like, you know, I have a, a gentleman G that I walk with. I call him affectionately G. Glenn Hollis with Talheimer, uh, Cushman Wakefield Talheimer. He's a, a developer in the area, and we walk the trail often, and we talk about rivers of living water. And they're deep in your belly. And this is all biblical. And so I apologize again if I'm offending somebody. And, and you might be surprised after some of the language for me to go biblical on you. But it's like this feeling you get when you know you're doing the right thing and you're spreading the good energy in the world. And you just want it to continue on and live on and, and allow others to like feel it. And man, it all starts with a smile. And then it starts with your language. And then it goes into your actions. And so if you're able to just help one person, like, I don't want to get all cliche on us, but if we really want to change the world and like, let's start, like, throw your topic in there, whatever, like race. We, we touched a little bit with the privilege thing when, when we can understand other people's perspective and we're able to have honest, candid conversations. We're able to grow in those moments or we're able to, to learn both ways, right? Because like, you know, a person's opinion is a person's opinion, right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, and so that feedback is like, man, he promoted these uncomfortable conversations and approached it from a place of, of Jesus and righteousness and what's good uh, and, and good and versus 
bad and, and I haven't always been good. I'll be the first one to tell you that I'm, I'm living proof. I've just never been caught. Right. And so I think that's an important difference and, and maybe that's a, a privileged concept as well, quite honestly. And so, um, like, man, he was a vulnerable person. Like he, you know, he wasn't better than anybody. He, he, and I'm working on this too. Like I always try to be the dumbest person in the room intentionally mm -hmm. because the dumbest person in the room learns the most that day typically. And so I've had a, a, a lean leader yesterday, Colin Milberg, who's an amazing person. He came up through the trades as well. You we should get him on here. Uh, but it, you know, he told me like, Hey, you actually got, you got something there, man. You might want to not be the dumbest person in the room sometimes and be able to share that. And I'm hitting kind of that point in my career, right? I'm like at that 20 year mark, 22, if we want to count them years as a plumber, I, I, which I always do. And so it, it's sharing that and giving that back and understanding that there is a need for it and, and you, you can help somebody else. And, and so I've, I've always tried to do that from like a, a lifestyle perspective, but now like having something professionally to give back or encourage historically underserved folks uh, to, to go and have these uncomfortable, like get outside your comfort zone and come learn something new. Because I'm going to be honest with you, Jesse, and not to no disrespect to any of the tradespeople either, but you know, the work itself, when you put your mind to it, it's not overly complicated. You just mm -hmm. got to put your mind to it and have the willpower and use the right language and get in that right mindset to make it happen. And so if you can learn a trade, whether it's framing or plumbing or electric, like, think about the endless upholstery or whatever, and you can get excited and passionate and, and energetic about it, man, that's when we've really, really won as a society. And so I, Hoots just drove that message, right? Like, what a good president of the United States that guy was. I'd love that opportunity, man, to just have like a good old plumber from South Carolina, like move over Donald, move over Joseph, and just think of the amount of people that you could empower from that position. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. Like the man, the responsibility that would come along with that. I would love a shot of that. Love it. That's vision, baby. I picked up on a, a on a very powerful ec exercise that that you just articulated, but you mentioned the word ikigai two times. Would you mind uh, shining some light on that for our listeners out there? Did I really say it twice? Oh yeah. Oh man. Sure. I'm gonna go to the Google really fast and make <laughs> sure I don't mess it up because I'll Do tell you what Google. it means. To me. I'm gonna use. Yeah, tell the us Google. what it means to you. Use the Google. And then to use the Google. Yes, because I think that's an important thing that that a lot of that'll benefit people. You know, there's there's concepts and ideas and language out there that we can often get twisted up because we're trying to live by the definition as per Google, as per the expert that introduced it to you. But there is also tremendous value in digesting the concept and the idea and the language and making it a part of you. And so your understanding is really the important thing, but it's also important to know where that came from. So please. So to me, uh, it's my purpose. It's, it's my reason for being. It's, it's what I love. It's what I'm passionate about. It's, it's where, I, where I invest my time, my energy, my, it's, it's my purpose. It, it's my reason for being here on this earth. And so I'm very fortunate that I've found that. I think many people go through life without finding that. And honestly, I'm just now discovering that because really my icky guy, there, there's this, these levels of experience that I've in, in situations that I've been through that have contributed to my icky guy and shaped that icky guy to and it's I-K-I-G-A-I, -I, and I'm so sorry, like, for tossing the Japanese terms around. I hate people that do that. I literally hate people that do that. <laughs> so my father and I are writing a book right now as well. I, haven't met, I may or may not have mentioned this to you, the old dog lean thesaurus. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And so it's funny as hell because my dad is, an, is an, like an old school superintendent at Whiting Turner and does all their Disney World work, IPD, blah, blah, blah. And, you know. So he's like kind of this old 
eek is what I call him. And I'm like the new dog is what I call it. Like okay. the, we've kind of got this mindset backward. It, it's funny. It's, it's a good combination. But so the, the whole book is like we're taking these Japanese terms of what lean consultants love to throw Kaizen and Ikigai and the last planner system. And we're just going to like help the old school superintendent, like, look, this isn't nothing new. Like, you're a great builder. You've been doing this for years. Like who needs to use the word Gimba? Like it's field. It's going to the field. It's standing there and seeing the operation or icky guy. It's your purpose, man. It's like what you, you know, and, and they have this great, I don't know. And so icky guy is like this uh, combination of what you love, what the world needs, what you're good at and what you can be paid for. And so when you find this center that's called your icky guy, and so in Japan, the concept of retirement doesn't exist because you always have something to contribute back to your icky guy. So they spend a lot of time getting into the right position and, and really making their work a part of their life. And, and you know, that, that helps so much with life balance, but what, Experts are, can, and again, sorry, I don't know the book, but uh, if it, actually it was the Ikigai book. I think that's what it's called is Ikigai. They actually, the Japanese live longer than Americans. And yeah, I was so surprised. This is the book. It's fantastic. Written by Hector Garcia and Francis Morales. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's a proven fact. In Japanese culture, they live longer, and people are a firm believer that it's because they're connected to their purpose for their entire life. And so that makes a huge difference when you live in this world where you, you see this passion and you have a mission and your job aligns with what you're doing, and it's just this saddest this feeling. It's where that river of living waters comes from. It's like, man, I get excited. Like, we, we've just spent an hour... I don't even know how long, an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes on the phone together. And it's like, we just picked up and, and I know we'll spend a couple of days next week talking, you know, four or five o'clock in the morning. Like that's, I have no issue getting up that early to talk to you and Jen and Jason and Felipe like this. It's amazing the the connection there. And so when you're living in that space, it's just, it's not work, right? It's, it's like, it's just my passion and my energy. And so I'm excited to, to um, be in a place where, you know, we can take some of these terms that people overcomplicate and we can break them down because they don't have to be so, you know, theoretical, right? When you understand them from a practical mindset, it's just your purpose. It's, it's why you're getting paid and what you love to do. Beautiful explanation. Thank you for the extra resources for folks. Catch it on the YouTube. You know, you also answering the question about what people were going to be talking about at your funeral. How did you happen up, up, upon that, thinking of things from that perspective? How was that introduced to you? Man, I died already. Yeah. I had a, I was on kidney dialysis. I really wasn't going to dive in. You just, <laughs> your questions bring it out of me. So high school athlete, went to college, Thought I was going to go play football, uh, dressed out for the practice team, didn't travel, didn't dress, and quit very quick. Decided to be a regular college student, did treat my body with respect. And so at the age of 28, I was put on kidney dialysis. I did have a couple of kidney diseases. I, you know, had more than usual fun as a college student. And so at 28, I went into end stage renal failure. I was on dialysis for a year and a half, both peritoneal and hemo. I very much encourage the peritoneal for what it's worth. Uh, you do it at home. It's anyway, if you, if anybody knows folks on dialysis, it is the most miserable life one can expect. You, you know, you're constantly cleaning yourself. You can't use the restroom. You, by the end of the day, you feel terrible. The toxins are built up. It's, it's a rough life. And so you know, I'm pretty happy. Good lucky dude. I hated life. I wanted to kill myself. I, it was really, really rough. And my mom was cleared, but had to watch a spot on her lung for a year before that she could donate. And so going into that kidney transplant, I was really, really nervous. I was scared. I thought I was going to die. And I discovered lean during that period too, actually trying to, you know, how do I get more out of my life? What is value? You know, 
understanding that, you know, I don't, again, pulling it from a book, I don't remember which one, but life is like a perspective in a football stadium. You only have about 30,000 days and each day you get a different view from a different seat. And so that became real to me. And a kidney transplant on January 7, 2014, you know, I, I went to sleep on that operating table. And when I woke up, man, I, I swear, like, this is heaven. Like, I, I've been, I've got perfect kids. Well, <laughs> I've got perfectly <laughs> healthy children. I've got, you know, and they're really good. We talk to them a lot. We, you know, we talk lean concepts. They laugh when I mention lean. And I've, I've got a great group of friends. I've got a beautiful wife who loves me and uh, cares. And, and so I spent a lot of time, you know, kind of getting back to that question, like, what is life like without me here? And, you know, that's a serious reflection question and wrote letters to my family. Like, if I don't wake up, open this. And, and they still haven't opened them to this day, but they'll have that. And, and so to be able to leave something like that to your family is, it's important that we live our life thinking about what are people going to say at my funeral? Like, who's even going to be at my funeral? You know, and, and you know, what's that party going to be like? You know, when Jesse gets to hang out with my old high school friends, it is going to be fun. I, I trust that she'll let loose and, and have a good time. When, when I woke up and, and it just, life was so perfect and, and it's, the vision is there and you got another chance and you know, what's value? Can you, I can make coffee in 44 seconds in the morning. I tell that story all the time because I don't want to spend, you know, the other 44 seconds it used to take me making coffee for the rest of my life, that's a week. That 44 seconds transitioned into a week. And so when we, you know, really look at that, and, and I will just like pause and, and mention, you know, Kyle Settle, who was a pre-construction manager for DPR just this past week. God bless his soul, he just passed away. And, and you know, you stop and think he had three young boys and a, and a wife and you know, he, he was just like us. He was 37 years old. He was perfectly healthy. He was, he was a Marine from the city. He graduated from the Citadel, which is like huge honors. Everything you know, that puts you a, a leg above everybody and, you know, perfectly healthy dude and passed away from COVID this past week. He had a headache and fever on Thursday and by Tuesday he had passed. And so, you know, in honor of him, it's like, man, uh, what a beautiful guy, like a beautiful soul, Bible study every Friday. He was first one in the office, like loved life. So just full of energy, had his own farm, took care of the animals, you know, the like discipline that comes in with that, it, it happens fast. And so live your life with that expectation of, of trying to understand uh, what is this? Cause the world will go on, right? Like we, it, it will continue without you. That's a fact. And, and so, do what you can now to modify the world later into this virtuous system. And you do that by putting systems in place, by really diving in and understanding what your icky guy is and connecting with your purpose and just loving it, like loving the problems that we have here. Because, you know, if everything were perfect in perfect order, like it will be when we arrive to our final destination, it wouldn't be as entertaining and fun and you wouldn't have this learning and growth and, and development and connection to a team. So again, million miles from where we started, but uh, hopefully somewhere within that journey was an answer to your question. Absolutely. I think it's an answer to the question and also some powerful direction for, for the L and M family out there, man. I appreciate you being, being you, Adam, vulnerable, honest, alive, man. I appreciate you. Love you, Mr. Adam Hoots. I love you, sir. All love, uh, baby. I love you too, Jesse. I wouldn't let you stay in my house if I didn't. Uh, three days, right? Three days. And yeah. I start stinking. To go, baby. <laughs> See? And you only took one of those. Shame on you. Yeah, that's all right. I got two in the bank. <laughs> oh, you got five in the bank, but not all at once. <laughs> cool, man. Well, What's your, can I ask you one question? Absolutely, man. What's your icky guy? What's your purpose? So my purpose is to share the gifts and talents that I've been blessed with in helping people expand their influence within their, the communities they serve. That's it. You've practiced that. 
I have. I mean, it it's it it took me a lot of reflection to figure out first like the questions of the ikigai, right? Like, what am I good at? What brings value? All of those things, and you know, so the first part of it is my sharing my gifts and talents. My gifts and talents, I've been blessed with a lot of them, but the, I think the strongest ones are connecting with people. And and you you've touched on it a few times in connecting with people. I've also been blessed with an ability to to kind of pick up on the story that people are telling themselves and ask questions around that that cause them to discover something new that they hadn't considered. And that's kind of been a thing. And and so then it becomes a question of, well, why does that even matter? Well, it matters because what that can do if when I'm responsible with it is help people expand their influence within their community and community covers career it covers everything so if they want to expand you know their their position with the organization they're working with we can do that if they want to expand their the depth of love and appreciation they have in their personal relationships we can do that if they want to expand their their income like all the things we can do that And the only way that for me, the only way that I'm fulfilling that purpose is by sharing my gifts and talents. And so that also requires me to to take ownership of it and get past the cognitive dissonance that you mentioned earlier, where it's easy for me to say, to tell myself that I'm less than and to write, to remind myself of of all the arrests that I've had and all the, the shitty things that I've done to people and all the hearts that I've broken, the people that I've let down, it's easy for me to dwell in that. But when I dwell in that, I am not sharing my gifts and talents. And so it's also a call to action. So all wrapped up in it, it's exactly that. I've got to share my gifts and talents and help people expand their influence in the communities because that's what I'm called to do. Like I cannot ignore it. Even when, even the years that I was trying to dilute the call with with substances with alcohol with women with all of the stuff it would not go away it was always there and it wasn't until i fully embraced it right i i was in i was in rehab uh inpatient rehab and one of the counselors told me said jesse the problem is you're willing to admit that you have a problem you're willing to stand up and say, hey, I'm Jesse, I'm an addict or I'm an alcoholic or, you know, all of the things because I was I was addicted to more, period. I just needed and wanted more of everything. He says, you have no problem admitting your problem is accepting. And I'm like, OK, now we're just playing around with words. And he says, no, what you haven't accepted is that it, you will not become the promise you are intended to be if you continue to live life this way. And right then and there, just it was a, a laser beam into my soul that said, OK, enough's enough. It's time for you to take ownership for the gifts and the talents that you've been blessed with. And it's time for you to get past your damn self and start serving. Uh, so, yeah, I've practiced it a little bit. I love it, man. You get me so excited You're talking about changing communities and speaking to what I mentioned earlier, you have my mind a million miles an hour at different places. When when we mentioned the word race earlier, like if we want to change a community's perspective on that, we've got to go to our home. We've got to look internal and don't give me this. Well, I don't. It's not me because everybody is saying and until we own it internally and we accept it, like you just said, that it's it's real and it's a thing and we need to fix it. And, and when we finally accept that fact, then we can change it. But it's the change starts in our own home and then it starts with our neighbors and then it starts with our neighborhood and then it gets to our town and our city and our state and our country yes. and our world. Like that's 
that's how changing community works is when folks really start accepting it. So I love the parallel that you just brought and, and man, the vulnerability there, like <laughs> you're a special dude, man. Yeah. I'll love Jesse. Thank you for allowing me to ask a couple of questions here. I am learning from the best. Boom. Love it, man. All right. Well, did you have fun, Adam? It was magical. It was amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. I appreciate the platform, but again, it, it's it's bigger than me, right? It, it, yeah. Hey, let's start embracing that respect for people so that folks want to come to our industry. Oh, baby. I don't know about you, but that was some deep conversation. You know, every time Adam and I connect, it, it, it ain't nothing but real talk, straight up real talk every time. Hit him up on Construction Ache Solutions. He's doing some great things out there. Now it's time for us to show a little bit of appreciation to our listeners that are giving us feedback. Keep it coming. This feedback comes to us from Miss Bernice Suma. Miss Bernice says, wow, just listen to the podcast and I am overwhelmed. How can I join in being a part of the team to do the same in my company and my country, PNG? That's like New Guinea, worldwide, baby. Miss Bernice, thank you for the feedback. It is extremely meaningful to know that our little podcast here that started in San Antonio, Texas, on the south side of San Antonio, Texas, has reached out and touched you in such a way that you're motivated to do something and, and get your voice out there. Any way we can help you get launched, I'm down. I want to play a part in that. And to the rest of y'all, love that you're giving us your time. Love the feedback that we're getting, the likes and the shares. Uh, please, please take care of yourself, be kind to yourselves, and keep an eye out for those little misters and missuses out there that are, are maybe a little lost and, and not sure exactly what they want to do for the rest of their life. I mean, hell, I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life, but maybe you could turn them onto this podcast and, and show them a different angle of, of construction professionals. And, and they may even, they may find that it's a little more interesting than they originally thought. We got some live stream events coming up. Hit us up on YouTube. We'll get more details out on our social media stuff. And looking forward to connecting with you again soon. Man, you are one dedicated listener sticking with us all the way through to the very, very end. Please know that this podcast dies without you. And we invite you to share how the episode's impacting you, along with your thoughts, questions, and suggestions. You've been gracious with your time, so we added social media links in the show notes to make it super easy for you to connect with us. Be kind to yourself, stay cool, and we'll talk at you next time.